I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. And you know, it's all about the neighborhood. This is a conversation about how we build our community, our neighborhood, house by house, family by family. We're focusing on business creation, business development, economic development, and culture. Hi, I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. I'm pleased to have as a guest today Dr. Benjamin F. Chavis, Jr. He's president and CEO of National Newspaper Publishers Association, NNPA. We call it the Black Press of America. Uh, coming up is Black Press Month, Black Press Week. We'll talk about that on this program. Also pleased to have a guest and partner for this program, my colleague Tom Gatta. Tom Gita is the publisher and president of Mshali, a Twin Cities-based paper that serves the African, African American community. Our goal today is to talk about uh, the role of the black press, both current issues and business considerations, what it means to serve as the information conduit for the development of our people and our community. What's important in the news of late is the story of terror, terrorism, and the question of racism. We've got a unique experience and relationship with those things in this country. Terra uh, is associated, in my mind, with uh, the experience of African people, uh, North African people, uh, the question of jihad, the question of Somali, uh, what they call Somali or, or Arab, or they're calling it Islamic terror. Those are loaded phrases. I want to get into that in this program. But then as African Americans, as Africans in the West, we have our own story, our own experience, our history with the notion of terror. So Dr. Benjamin Chavis, first of all, thank you for being here. And in this week's Insight News, you're talking about uh, twin evils, racism and terrorism. Talk about that if you would. Uh, thank you very much. First, on behalf of the National Newspaper Publishers Association, Al, I'm so always glad to be in your presence, and Tom, glad to be in your presence. Uh, I'm a strong advocate of uh, the black press. I'm a strong advocate of black publishers, uh, black-owned business people. We need to uh, control much more of the commerce that goes on in our community. Now, on the issue of terrorism and racism, certainly uh, black Americans and black people all over the world know something about both of these, uh, uh, not just terminologies, but impact on the quality of life. Uh, terror just didn't start with, uh, since 9-11. Uh, I know that's a popular phrase people use now, terror and terrorists. Who are they and, and what is it? Uh, and I believe that it's important in any term that's used, we go back to the root of it. Uh, w what is the first known expression of terror in the world? And certainly uh, one would say that uh, the use of violence, the use of physical force to subjugate whole peoples uh, using violence uh, for economic exploitation as well as uh, domination of their resources, their human resources, their natural resources. You have to go to the uh, transatlantic uh, tra uh, slave trade. You have to go to um, certainly what was going on between uh, the Crusades uh, and uh, President Obama was right to make note of that. He got himself in a little trouble. A lot mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. right-wing Christians uh, attacked the president for reminding Christians that terrorism is in the evolution of, uh, of Christianity, mm -hmm. uh, to subdue people violently. And to me, uh, I think you, you get people to be faithful not by uh, subjecting them uh, to inquisitions, not by subjecting them to murder, not subjecting them to burning at the stake. Mm -hmm. uh, all these things happen as a part of human history. So contemporarily, now that these terms are being used uh, with respect to the Middle East, or respect to Afghanistan, or Iraq, or Syria, or Iran, uh, you know, uh, most Americans, I think, have amnesia. We seem to forget that the world uh, has been co conflicted with the reality of racial discrimination, mm -hmm. racism, and the, uh, the economics of racism, and the use of terror to enforce the false ideology of white supremacy. Big, uh, big statement. And so, as you look at 
the African American community and the immigrant African community today in Minnesota and in this country, how are we impacted by the stream of news, the public reportage that uh, sort of distills everything to uh, Arab or uh, Islamic terror as catchphrases, yes. and then by association there's always the color piece that goes right. with that. Well, I, you know, I, I wrote in my article yeah. that yeah. when the Ku Klux Klan uh, burned down churches, when the Ku Klux Klan lynched, when the Ku Klux Klan set people on fire, uh, there was no reference to them being Christian terrorists. You know, and so I, I think that uh, I reject the whole notion of uh, Islamic, terrorist. Islamic terrorism or uh, uh, Hindu terrorism, Buddhist terrorism, Christian terrorism. I, I don't think religions, at least the major religions, uh, condone uh, the, uh, the wanton, indiscriminate taking of life to achieve a uh, political objective, to achieve a military objective. That's why we have uh, crimes against nature even in the, in the conventions of war. There are certain things even in war you are not allowed to do. Mm -hmm. And to me, I think that um, the whole dialogue of the mainstream media is biased. Uh, sometimes it's ahistorical. It is very political. Mm -hmm. And I think that... Um, it's intentional. Uh, right, and that is why uh, the black press and press uh, in the African diaspora has to not just give the antidote to this kind of poison, but the reality of the truth. I'm in favor of transparency. I think that um, uh, sin is not uh, 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 cordoned off or cornered just to one group in the world. Mm -hmm. and, and I think so is right and wrong. We have to be able to distinguish between what's right and what's wrong without getting... Um, hoodwink, as Malcolm X would say, by these terminologies that are thrown at us and all of a sudden former slaves are using the lingo of former right. slave masters. Right. That's a problem. Right. So Tom Guitar, speaking uh, as an immigrant and reflecting the sensibility, uh -huh. the awareness and understanding of the uh, newly arrived Africans, uh -huh. new African Americans, how does the common daily reportage, television primarily reportage, impact our community? What, how does it make us feel, uh, both uh, newly arrived immigrants and, and our African-American brothers that you interact with? What's your sense about that? Yeah, thank you, Al. Uh, I think the, uh, the situation a uh, lot of the African immigrants have been put on in, uh, especially the um, uh, Muslim immigrants, uh, is uh, the equate, equating of um, uh, Islam and terrorism. Uh, that's uh, that's a major source of concern uh, for many of us, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, we know, you know, for myself, I'm a Christian, uh, but uh, the and Kenya, you know, is predominantly Christian. But the section I grew up in, uh, the city I grew up in, is called Mombasa, and uh, that uh, the second largest city in Kenya is the predominant religion there is Islam. Mm -hmm. uh, so so. We, we know how to coexist with each other uh, without many issues. So we, we know that uh, Islam is not uh, equating, does not mean uh, terrorism. Uh, but uh, the existing uh, climate right now, especially, you know, like last week there was the, um, the Al Shabaab, you know, the Mall of America thing with uh, Al Shabaab mm -hmm. encouraging people to go attack it. Um, a radicalized people to go attack it, uh, so to say, so to speak. But uh, you know, that's the quandary a lot of us find ourselves in. You know, if you're a Muslim African, you're put in this box of uh, you know, you, if you're Islam and you look a certain way. If you're Muslim, uh, terrorism, you know, profiling at the airport, mm -hmm. you know, these this kinds of issues, it's, it's a major source of concern. And if you, if you recall what was happening this week, uh, there was this expectation that uh, the Somalis had to come out and, uh, and, and, you know, and, and apologize for the video that uh, Al Shabaab put out about the Mall of America. And, and many of us felt that was not necessary. Right. Uh, because, you know, the Somalis, they have nothing to do with Al-Shabaab. Actually, as you know, they are the main uh, uh, victims of mm -hmm. Al-Shabaab back in Somalia, or their families are. So there is, uh, that, that's kind of the reality that a lot of uh, the people here are dealing with, uh, you know, where the uh, mainstream media, uh, without 
being explicit, uh, you know, Islam and terrorism are the same thing. As if Islam endorses terrorism, it does not. Well, well, I think you know there there's the cultural wars mm -hmm. going on. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, back in the day, Al knows, when communism was the uh, boogie bear. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yes. And so everybody, they were having hearings, who's a communist, who's not a communist. They accused Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. of being a communist. Mm -hmm. there are, there's a whole group of actors right now in Hollywood never got a job since they were blackballed because they were considered communists. The reason why I'm bringing this up mm -hmm. is because after uh, the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, the people in the West, they had to come up with the new boogie bear. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, uh, some of the people at the Heritage Foundation, mm -hmm. which is a right-wing think, think, think tank think in Washington, yes. D.C., they said, aha, uh -huh, the new boogie bear will be Islam, mm -hmm. will be Islamist extremists, mm -hmm. extremism. Mm -hmm. And again... It's uh, their invention. Exactly. Yeah. So, and it's amazing how after a period of years, mm -hmm. even decades, all of a sudden, this creeps into mainstream media uh, lexicology. Yes. And, and I think that, uh, again, that is why we need a more uh, objective, mm -hmm. a more truthful press. And, and I think it's so uh, wrong for the Somalian American community in the United States to be targeted mm -hmm. based on some uh, uh, statements that are made by some group mm -hmm. that certainly does not represent mm -hmm. uh, the majority of the Somalian people. I think that's a, it's, a, it's interesting to me how these fringe groups, including ISIS and all of them, uh, who are on the fringe of, of uh, existence, wind up controlling or the response of the majority of the population is always to put everybody in the same vein. And, and I think that particularly with the demographics now changing in America, mm -hmm. the so-called browning of America, mm -hmm. um, it's going to be interesting to see how um, particularly in the United States of America, where, um, and that's why the debate now about immigration. You see, they want to hold up uh, funding the Department of uh, uh, um, Homeland Security uh, and, and use that as a lever to prevent President Obama from executing his executive uh, order on immigration. <laughs> and see, underlying that is really not the issue of immigration. It's the issue, is America going to be a multiracial, multilingual, multicultural democracy for everyone? Mm -hmm. Or are we going to be an exclusive mm -hmm. uh, sort of a bourgeois democracy only for a few based on how much you're able to accumulate in terms of material wealth? That's the question. That's the and that question. would be a shadow yeah. for the oligarchy, actually. Absolutely. It would be an illusion mm -hmm. to say that there's a stable and permanent middle class because reality is that middle class is shrinking and the wealth is being concentrated at the top at an alarming rate. So think back, Dr. Chavis, about, uh, as you just said those comments, uh, about Nat Turner. And is there a parallel? Uh, the Nat Turner experience created a huge galvanizing of white supremacist thought by creating fear. Are we experiencing that again? Yes, uh, I, I think that's, uh, I'm glad you, after the Nat Turner insurrection, which was in the 1830s. Uh, the state of Virginia, the state of North Carolina, the state of South Carolina, the state of Georgia, made it a felony to teach blacks how to read and write. Why? What, what, what is violent about reading and writing? It was their reaction to the Nat Turner insurrections. They were, well, the way to stop slave insurrections is to make sure those slaves never read, is to make sure that they never write, is to make sure that they don't communicate. You know, rather than saying, you know, after the Nat Turner insurrection, maybe slavery is wrong. Maybe we should treat these people better. These are human beings. Mm -hmm. These are not property. So yes, there is a, an overreaction uh, by uh, people who are not from the Middle East. There's an overreaction uh, from people who are not from Africa. There's an overreaction uh, to people of color. And that is why what the United Nations recently did by having a decade from 2015 to 2025 uh, as the decade of Africa, uh, people of African that descent is, yeah. is so important, not only for people of African descent, but for people who are non-African right. descent. They need to have a greater, deeper appreciation of the struggle, of the sacrifice, of the human misery mm -hmm. that has been imposed 
on millions and millions and millions of people for a long, long time. And uh, there uh, appears to be uh, utter disregard and, uh, for all the religious people. Where is their repentance? For all the religious people, where is their uh, um, sense of, of uh, trying to uh, realign the posture uh, in the world in which we live in? So I, I think that this is a timely uh, mm -hmm. debate. And I'm hoping that African Americans and African people in general will not just sit on the sideline mm -hmm. and be witnesses mm -hmm. uh, to this, d these distortions. We have to weigh in, and we have to weigh in with truth, we have to weigh in with definition, and we have to weigh in. I think history, in this case, is on the side of those who struggle for liberation. You know, we're going to come back and talk more about the UN decade for people of African descent, the theme for that, uh, the theme, I think, is recognition, justice, and development. Yes. Powerful ideas. And the idea of focusing the energy of the world, particularly of the African diaspora, on those ideas for a period of 10 years, I think, is important. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. My guest, Dr. Benjamin F. Chavis, Jr., President and CEO of the NNPA, National Newspaper Publishers Association. We call it the Black Press of America, and my colleague and co-host today, uh, Brother Tom Guitar, the president and publisher of Mshali. And Tom is also the chairman of the Minnesota Multicultural Media Consortium. We'll talk about that as well. Stay tuned. <laughs> It's just the robber So light to the merchant ships Moments after they come It took her From the bottomless pits But my hand Was made strong By the hands of the almighty And we for this generation triumphantly won't you help me shine I'm Alan McFarland. Welcome back to Conversations with Alan McFarland. My guest today, Dr. Benjamin F. Chavis Jr. He's president and CEO of NNPA, the National Newspaper Publishers Association. We call it the Black Press of America. My co-host today is Tom Gatta. Tom Gatta is the president and publisher of Mshali. He's also the chairman of our Minnesota collaboration. We call it the Minnesota Multicultural Media Consortium. And so, uh, gentlemen, I want to talk about the need for us to work together uh -huh. and the value of what we bring as communications professionals, not only to our people, but to the world. Dr. Chavis, uh, maybe give our listeners uh, a story or a brief uh, absolutely. on um, the history of the black press. Well, thank you. The, the history of the black press goes all the way back to Freedom's Journal 180-some years ago. Um, the first black newspaper was uh, put together. And you have to understand that even at the founding of our country, if you look at what Benjamin Banneker and all these people did uh, as, as revolutionaries, um, most people don't know that a lot of blacks fought in the uh, American Revolution mm -hmm. against the British. That's why Cephas Adams was the first to die in Boston. But going forward, and also Prince Hall, I, you know, I, I don't know if you saw the thing I wrote about Prince Hall, mm -hmm. uh, because in um, the first lodge, but it was called at the African Lodge. Right. Mm -hmm. right. They, they knew they were African. Mm -hmm. uh, when the AME Church first got started, it was called the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And before then, it was called the Free Africa Society. They had a the togetherness. Mm -hmm. So um, to the credit of John Sinstack and others, uh, 75 years ago, the National Newspaper Publishers Association was founded in Chicago, a group of publishers uh, from around the country had come together. Including one from here, and Cecil Newman. That's right. Uh, the founder of the Minnesota Spokesman Spokesman Reporter. Reporter. That's right. One of the gentlemen at the table to help form exactly. the NNPA. Exactly. And the wisdom was, we're stronger if we work together. Mm -hmm. We formed this trade association. Because even back then, 75 years ago, 
it was it was a similar situation to today, where the formulation of theories and analysis about Black America was being propagated by the mainstream press to the detriment of Black people, and that's why in the very beginning the Black press became the voice of Black America. Uh, on a weekly basis, we even had some dailies over the years, monthlies. Uh, uh, one of the things James Baldwin used to tell me uh, before he passed, he said, Ben, the pen is mightier than the sword. Mm -hmm. And so we have to write. And that is the legacy, not only the historical legacy, but the contemporary reality of the black press in America. It is needed. Mm -hmm. And for all of our young people out there who are going to watch this program, I, I support self-expression. Mm -hmm. To me, that's part of being a human being. You have to express yourself. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the self-expression of black America is documented uh, through the written word, through the photography, and through the things that we fo focus on. Even how we cover sports is different than the mainstream uh, press or the culture of our community. So I think today, in 2015, there's more need for the black press in America than it was 75 years ago. And so we're going to use this anniversary uh, at our convention uh, in Detroit uh, in June of this year to uh, reaffirm not only the legacy, but reaffirm the contemporary importance of the black press in America uh, as business people, as journalists, as truth tellers, and as freedom fighters. Uh, quite frankly, uh, Al knows to be a publisher in black America, you also have to be a freedom fighter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's fascinating. I have an article I wrote just a few days ago, Dr. Chavis, that says that um, to be a publisher is to be a freedom fighter. Right. Those right. words exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and, uh, go ahead, Yeah, because I was going to ask you, and um, how do we keep that legacy going? How do we sustain, um, uh, you know, the black press? Yes. As you know, you know, uh, not just the black press, but uh, all other media is under the... Uh, serious challenges yes uh, but uh, I believe we need to keep the black press alive thriving and well uh, what are your thoughts on that well fundamentally the way to do it mm -hmm. is to uh, we have to raise up uh, freedom fighters are not uh, they don't fall out of the sky yes. they're nurtured exactly. they're mentored so I'm asking all of our newspapers mm -hmm. to make sure you have apprentices mm -hmm. make sure you have young people coming there to learn how to put the paper together, to learn the value of writing, to learn the value of self-expression. I think we have to engage our young people, while they are young, mm -hmm. of the importance of the black press, and then allow them, while they are young, to participate in the various aspects of the, of the black press, as reporters, as journalists, as uh, uh, layout people, all of the things they've done. Now, with the digital component, you know, a lot of our young people now, they get their reality on their device. Yeah, exactly. So we're encouraging a number of our newspapers to make sure you have an electronic version of your newspaper that has a mobile app. That, it, that So when people uh, cut on their uh, device, they can get the black press right there as well as the print. Not to take the place of the print, but to complement and to undergird the print. That way, I think we have a great future going forward. Here's what I wrote about this, Tom. I said that uh, my experience in Minnesota in creating Insight News, what, 30 years ago now, 19, I think 74 is when I launched Insight as a magazine, 76 as a newspaper. Uh, I went to um, area businesses asking them to buy advertising in my newspaper. I said, I've got a newspaper that's serving North Minneapolis, which is the black community. We're delivering 10,000 copies door to door to neighbors and businesses. And as often as not, a big company would look at me and smile and kind of laugh and say, uh, I gave in church on Sunday, get out of here. And so uh, I wrote this, that they viewed my small paper, my small business as charity, not as a business. And they said they already gave because they support United Way or something else like that. But more importantly, they viewed our community as an arena of philanthropy not as an arena of Business. economic yeah. enterprise. So that was the challenge. And my response to that, Tom Gata, was to reach out to, uh, not you at the time, but other publishers. Uh, and we created this group called the Minnesota Minority Media Coalition, which has morphed into the Minnesota Multicultural Media Consortium that you are the chair of. And our philosophy was that we do more together than we can alone. And I went back to those same companies and said, 
uh, look, I'm not here on my own behalf alone. I'm here on behalf of 300,000 black people, Asian people, Latino people, and Native Americans. Is that a number you can deal with? It's not 10,000. And the answer was, yes, we can do business, and we got business. So that was the important thing. How do we amalgamate and create collaborations that allow us to deliver uh, something that's manageable, that's tangible to the marketplace that we define? And more or as important um, to me, this is a question of uh, practicing collaboration figuring out ways. The other thing I said in that article was that the nature of technology has changed the broad philosophy and understanding. Back then, the advertiser would say, uh, I'm a mass media marketer. I want to put my bucks where I get the biggest bang for the buck. Therefore, I buy ads in the Star Tribune, uh, 700,000 you know, circulation, and not inside news, 10,000 circulation, right? Uh, what's happened, though, is with digital technology, the market is going after what they call hyper-local reach. They want to reach people as close to where that person is as he or she can be reached. You mentioned the digital, right? So hyper-local means that where people aggregate themselves around particular interests, ideas, geographies, culture, that is a place where you can capture their business, their attention, and their revenue. So the understanding that's been created by the new digital capabilities has meant that nichemanship is the order of the day. And guess what? The black press, we are the niche masters. Well, we are the masters of the niche. Absolutely. And I just want to quantify the marketplace. Uh, the NMPA did a study with Nielsen, and we were able to document that black Americans spend in excess of $1.2 trillion every 12 months in the United States economy. So this is not charity. This is business. Mm -hmm. And we have to realign the business relationship between corporate America and black Americans, 43 million now, who spend $1.2 trillion. And so uh, the aggregation of our press in our associations means that we can leverage how those companies advertise. I think uh, for the major companies, Walmart, Target, Sears, Macy's, all these companies, uh, including the major automobile companies, GM, Ford, Chrysler, Toyota, and others, uh, we have to have realign to make sure that their advertising dollars are spent with um, uh, the papers that represent the hyper-local views and reality of this constituency. So to me, right now, there's an imbalance in the market mm -hmm. uh, uh, and the way these corporations spend advertising dollars vis-a-vis -vis the way they get the revenue mm -hmm. from the $1.2 trillion spending. African Americans in the last 12 months bought 28% of all Mercedes Benz. Al's got one. Yeah. <laughs> so I did my I need, share. Right? We should get some national ad buys yeah. from Mercedes Benz. Exactly. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, uh, so when we go to visit the CEOs of this company, when I go to Best Buy or to Target or to, or to General Mills or to, or to Calgal, I'm not asking for charity. I'm not asking for some tickets for a chicken dinner. I want a business relationship, mm -hmm. not necessarily a philanthropic, although we do have a NMPA foundation, right. and we do want some of those philanthropic dollars to go to our NMPA foundation. Mm -hmm. But on the business side, mm -hmm. we need to talk straight business, uh, a, a relationship that help, can help improve those bottom lines, but also to have sustainability to our press through national ad buys. Tom Guitar, let me ask you how you decided to come into the business. You were a corporate executive. Mm -hmm. You worked at a Best Buy. I think I mentioned you were at Best Buy. Mm -hmm. uh, you were a buyer, I think. Yeah, so buyer, you, yes, your experience is corporate. Mm -hmm. And you decided mm -hmm. to uh, enter this market as a publisher. And you've done extremely well. Mm -hmm. Your publication is a great one. It's beautiful and uh, well executed. You've got a great website. Mm -hmm. What made you, what compelled you to yeah, enter this foray? Actually, uh, to be honest with you, uh, <coughs> What happened back in the mid-90s, uh, I was still a college student here. Uh, you know, as, as you know my history, the way I, uh, I'm not a refugee, I came in as a student. 
uh, as you, you know, the, the Kenyan community in Minnesota, you know, we have a, what we call the big five, mm -hmm. uh, the big five of the African uh, immigrants, uh, you know, the Somalis being number one, number two are the, Eth uh, the Ethiopians, number three, the Liberians, and then the Kenyans are number four, and then the Nigerians are number five. Uh, so uh, out of those five communities, uh, the, the Kenyans are the majority non-refugee immigrant, uh, African immigrants, because mm -hmm. the top three are all came in via refugee status. So when I came in as a student, uh, um, uh, while in college, there was a deal, there was actually no, these were the pre-internet days. Uh, the web wasn't uh, as well established as it was in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, but I used to be linked in by an online community uh, that will share East African news. Mm -hmm. So I was, I tended to be in the know of what was going on back in East Africa. So I started sharing that with people just on an informal friendly basis and then I, I saw that there was a market opportunity. So I just started a two page newsletter, a printed newsletter weekly for folks, you know, they'll pay two bucks or a month or something. Uh, with just 10 copies to begin with, uh, just, just for fun, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. It wasn't like a money-making opportunity. It was just to just say, hey, there's an, uh, people need the news. Mm -hmm. They know I know something. Uh, yeah, so I printed it out for them and gave it, yeah, yeah. I gave it to them. Yeah. And then that went on for two, three years. And then, uh, you know, we started expanding, you know. The newsletter became 12, 10 pages at one, mm -hmm. uh, at one day. So it kept going up until we had to expand uh, to be a full newspaper uh, about four years later. Uh, and by 2000, uh, by 2000, it was actually a printed newsprint, the version you see now. Mm -hmm. uh, and my corporate career was, you know, was also going well. So this was just something I was doing on the side on the weekends mm -hmm. uh, for the community. Uh, but, you know, but uh, by the mid 2000s, you know, we had to kind of make a decision on whether I want to do corporate. Uh, it just became you could not have two masters, as they say. So I chose uh, publishing and left the corporate life uh, behind. And um, the rest, as they say, is history. You know, we've just kind of you know kept developing the publication, the website, and as uh, Ben just talked about uh, the apps, uh, we're currently trying to f figure one out and we might have one soon. So it was just a, 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 a desire to serve a need that was in the community uh, that also developed into a business opportunity and uh, it worked out good for, for me and my community. I'm Al McFarland. You're listening to Conversations with Al McFarland. We'll continue in a minute. Uh, Tom Gita, president and publisher of Mshali, and Dr. Benjamin F. Chavis, Jr., president and CEO of National Newspaper Publishers Association. Tom, that's a great segue, because when we come back, I want to talk uh, to you and Dr. Chavis about the entrepreneurial spirit, uh, the entrepreneurial nature of our work. And I think the uh, idea that uh, our health our education, our culture, uh, and uh, our future are our business. Business, in my view, has to be at the core of all that we do in seeking to develop our potential uh, and our partnership with everybody else on planet Earth. We'll come back in a minute. Stay tuned. Won't you? Help me sing These songs of freedom It's all I ever had Redemption song These songs of freedom Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. Follow them, kind of free our mind. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome back to Conversations with Al McFarland. Uh, I promised, and I'm delivering what I call a robust conversation. My guest, Dr. Benjamin F. Chavis Jr., President and CEO of NNPA, the National Newspaper Publishers Association. We call it the Black Press of America. And my co-host today, my partner and colleague here in Twin Cities, Tom Gita, president and publisher of Mshali. You know, we created uh, here the Minnesota Multicultural 
Media Consortium. We just finished a, a $3.5 uh, $9 million project with uh, uh, the American uh, Recovery and Reinvestment Act uh, initiative on uh, creating uh, digital access, our partnership with the University of Minnesota. The key is partnership. And so Tom and, and Dr. Ben, how do we really take this partnering, this collaborating to the next level so that we can really, number one, recognize and exploit uh, our genius as, yes. as people well, for I, our I, benefit? I think you've really put on, uh, to all the listeners and to all the people who are listening, this is the most important point. Mm -hmm. Together, we ought to be not only having strategic alliances, partnerships, uh, developing associations, but we need to collaborate in the business arena together. This is so very important. A lot of times we complain about what other groups that come to the United States, uh, all, before you know it, they have one business in a the block, they have the whole block. Mm -hmm. um, we have to not just be consumers, we have to be producers, and we have to form business relationships. So this entrepreneurial spirit that you're talking about is vital from 2015 going forward. We should use the next 10 years that the United Nations has uh, declared to the world the decade of people of African descent. Now we have to translate so it's just not something symbolic. I want to see the rise of people of African descent being in charge of the businesses in the community, mm -hmm. the, 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 the press, the banks, uh, the retail, uh, and then we come up with our own creativity. We've proven that God has blessed us we, with athletics and creativity, but now we have to translate our blessings in a business sense in terms of owning real estate. I was just with the black uh, NARAB, the National Association of uh, Real Estate mm -hmm. Brokers, and we're going to have a plan how to retake some of the real estate, uh, uh, residential and commercial, in all of our communities, we working, with the, the, working with the black press. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So listen, man, M. Shelley, Tom, I need your newspaper to be a part of the NNPA. Well, I'm saying that on the air. Yeah, we'll, we'll and, and I want us to use this 10-year period to expand our vision, mm -hmm. where the National uh, 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 Association uh, uh, I'll get all of our publishers together, the NNPA, the National Newspaper Publishers Association, and then we talk about how to expand. I want the black publishers in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. you from Jamaica, yeah. uh, from Brazil, mm -hmm. from Africa, yeah. from all over the world. We need a global working together but with the entrepreneurship at the center of it. And then we raise up a generation of business people as freedom fighters. I have to keep putting that in there because mm -hmm. sometimes People want to uh, create wealth and then leave the community. But no, you create wealth to lead the community forward so that everybody can have a sharing of the wealth and that the, at the end of the day we can say we contributed to improving exponentially the quality of life of our people. I can't, I can't add anything to that. Uh, the uh, entrepreneurship is very important. Mm -hmm. I come from a business family in Kenya, and we've continued that legacy. So entrepreneurship is, in, is critical because that's kind of how the community's resources actually get uh, uh, marshaled and then also stay within the community. But uh, speaking of the decade mm -hmm. uh, that uh, Ben has just put, the UN decade for people of African descent, uh, it's, 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 it, it's very interesting for me because uh, if you know Judge Lajun Lang, mm -hmm. uh, Judge Lajun, we were very, the few uh, black state judges who have had in Minnesota, mm -hmm. uh, retired now. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, she was working on the UN decade like 10 years ago when, mm -hmm. they, when this was in uh, formulation. Mm -hmm. You know, and she brought us, a few of us in you know, just to sensitize us that, hey, you know, this is under formulation, so keep thinking about it. But uh, it's very amazing that uh, it, is. Yeah, it is 2015, but yes. she was talking about yeah. it five, six years ago. Yeah. And things take time. Uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Uh, trying to you know, tell us, hey, we're developing this, and, and, and here it is. But I think it's an important decade that uh, people need to take note of. Uh, so here's, here's what intrigues me and what I wonder about uh, Tom Guitar and Dr. Ben Chavis. Uh, at some point in time, the relationship between Africans on the continent and Africans in North America and South America and the Caribbean, Africans in Europe and in Asia, uh, has to be uh, or emerge as a, an arena 
of practical, specific engagement. Do you see that happening? How can we make it happen? Oh, yeah, actually. And, and what role do media play in that? Yeah, um, media is, is important, but uh, uh, the, it actually has happened for many years. Mm -hmm. It's just that we don't drum, you know, it doesn't uh, come to the forefront of people's minds as it should. Because, like, in my case, I'm from Kenya, as mm -hmm. you know. Uh, the national anthem for Kenya, Thurgood Marshall, actually, uh, no, no, not the national anthem, but he played a very important role in the original Kenya constitution uh, when uh, Kenya was becoming independent uh, the, because the freedom fighters talked to him and he helped them shape some of it so mm -hmm. it can, you know, be a good one. But um, uh, the collaborations have actually been there and uh, we need to continue that because it's critical. Uh, in South Africa, for example, you know, the end of apartheid is uh, pretty much, uh, if it was not for the African-American community, I uh, forget the gentleman's name, um, uh, Sullivan. Uh, Leon Sullivan. Yeah, Sullivan. Leon Sullivan. And Leon all the, yeah, and all, yeah, 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 and all those... Uh, Who also was a publisher. Yes, uh, and, all those, uh, and all those efforts are what brought an end to apartheid. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, so these things are critical uh, because uh, the African American community, especially, is uh, you know because of the history, uh, the resources. Uh, you know, we have a lot of resources that we tend to think, uh, which is what makes it possible. But the thing I want to see continue uh, is uh, the back and forth. Uh, we want to have as many. African Americans visiting Africa, uh, that back and forth uh, um, uh, commute, you know, traveling mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is what actually cements uh, our relationships. I uh, threw the phrase out a few years ago, uh, Dr. Ben, no, no contact, no contract. That's true. And so the nature and the imperative, the, the, uh, the mandate has to be that we create uh, more contact yes. and sustain contact. Mm -hmm. Out of that contact comes natural. Uh, contracts, exactly. It's ways about, to serve each other. The, the, building a business is building a relationship, mm -hmm. and we should have a relationship with one another beyond Black History Month. Mm -hmm. Of course, we should have a relation, a lifelong relationship. Mm -hmm. That means we build lifelong businesses. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go back to the point that when we talk about business, sometimes people uh, have a too narrow view. Mm -hmm. The healthcare of our community is a business. Mm -hmm. The education of our community is a business. Mm -hmm. All about historically about colleges and universities. I was just down in Fayetteville, North Carolina, where they have a school called the Alpha Academy, mm -hmm. where they're going to start teaching our young people not only the STEM disciplines, but teaching our young people how to write code to, adapt, to write apps in the elementary school. Hmm. So math and science and technology and engineering, all these things we have to excel in. And this is why the black press, the reason why Brother Sullivan was able to do so well with the Opportunity Industrialization Center, the OIC centers uh, in, out of Philadelphia, was because the Philadelphia Tribune helped give widespread yeah. coverage to that. The Philadelphia Tribune is 130 years old, yeah. what Bob Bogan and Bob his Bogan. family yeah. Uh, yeah. continues to do. And I can just talk about the Los Angeles Center in, 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 in California, where they have this thing now called the Taste of Soul. Oh, almost a half million people so, uh, there's, gather. There's, so our events. Yeah. We have to network. Yes. I mean, I could just, if time permit, I could go down a long list mm -hmm. of what we're doing in North Carolina with the Black Publishers Association and many other states. I'm excited. That's why, I actually, I sought this job mm -hmm. because I see the black press, the publishers, as being the front line of the freedom fighting struggle for black people in the world, mm -hmm. not only in America. Correct. Yeah, there is this, um, uh, and I say it's external, but we... We uh, mimic it, the sense that, uh, that the black press is irrelevant. You've heard that, where people say, well, is the black press relevant? How do, how do we well, combat that well, the people who coming say, out of our mouths? The people who say that the black press is irrelevant wants to take the place of the black press. Yes. That they want the business. See, they first want us to underestimate our own selves, <laughs> there, there underestimate go. our own place in the world, and then they, they take our place. <laughs> See, that's, that's the, you know... The slickest form of slavery is to get you to enslave yourself. Yes, there we go. You know, yeah. so we, we're not going to buy into that. They said the same thing about historically about colleges and universities. Mm -hmm. They said the same thing about black churches. All the, we don't need black church. Black church is the root of our community. That's right. HBCU is the root of our educational enterprise. The black press 
uh, helps to sustain all other black presences. Without the black press, there will be no black community. Yeah, and, and now, you know, to, to that I say this, because, for example, uh, in speaking just of our community here in the Twin Cities, for example, uh, a lot of the sourcing that uh, the mainstream media uses, uh, a, lo a lot of the uh, most African immigrant journalists uh, that uh, mainstream media uses here, a lot of them, if you, if you look closely, they have had a very close association with Mushale. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know, they have, you know, either uh, collaborated with us, they have gotten their footing in, at Mushale, and then they move on to bigger things, mm -hmm. which is okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, in that one aspect alone, uh, we are relevant. Uh, and then also um, uh, just uh, giving a point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, for the community, that's important, and uh, I, don't, I have not had anybody discounting that part. I think the part we are uh, still uh, fighting for is the advertising dollars in an equitable fashion, but uh, the point of view, uh, nobody can discount that one. Well, let's close talking about the advertising dollars. That's yeah. really important. Uh, what does the black consumer understand as the relationship between his or her purchasing power and institutions like the black press. Uh, do we have to educate our people, number one, so that they understand the power they possess, or do we have to do our business differently so that we ensure that uh, we can provide the kind of service that will produce the financial returns that we're looking for as business owners? Well, I think it's a multi-pronged approach, approach. First, absolutely, we have to raise the level of awareness in the black community of uh, the continuing importance of the black press in America, absolutely. Secondly, we have to form strategic alliances, uh, the black press has, uh, with other entities uh, that can help uh, strengthen our leverage when we negotiate for the advertising dollar. Thirdly, I want to put this also in a global context. Mm -hmm. I, I think that the economy now is a global economy. And we have to reassert our place in the global economy uh, as the black press, as black businesses. And I think that if we do those three things, not sequentially, but simultaneously, yeah. we will make considerable progress uh, during this 10-year observation of the United Nations Declaration of the Decade of People of African Descent. Tom, what do you see for Africa in the next 10, 20 years uh, for uh, both consolidation of power in black people's hands, uh, the emergence of viable economies, uh, cooperation between nations, and ultimately the relationship between the diaspora, uh, both supporting and being supported by Africa. What's out there? Yeah, I mean, <coughs> this might sound cliche. You know, you've been hearing uh, mostly from mainstream media, but to some extent, they do have a point sometimes. You know, you've been hearing the term Africa rising uh, all over the place. Uh, but the, uh, you know, just like well, the what we used to call the Asian tigers, which was the rising economies of uh, Asia, and uh, now they are, you know, they are uh, giants in the world uh, economic stage. Uh, it's now Africa's uh, turn, I believe, uh, to to go to undergo the same thing that happened uh, with the Asian tigers. Uh, most of the growing economies right now are in Africa, uh, so the the question is. Um, uh, we have to make sure that uh, it's, the, uh, it's African people that actually own that, the success of that uh, mm -hmm. uh, transformation and uh, economic uh, opportunities that are right now prevalent in Africa. And the thing I've been actually pushing myself is uh, to make sure that uh, as many, at least where, where I'm based here locally in the, in the U.S., as many African-American black people uh, are able to tap in into the economic uh, potential that uh, Africa is now promising, which is it's a lot of money. There's a lot of money in that uh, continent, uh, the minerals, the uh, the resources. So we want, uh, you know, we do especially this decade, the the year decade. We definitely want as many uh, black people as possible, as unlike previous years. Uh, to be able to partake in that success of, uh, that Africa is, is enjoying right now and is going to enjoy for the next 10 years. Right. I think we have to have reciprocal trade delegations. Yes. We take a dele trade delegation to Africa. Mm -hmm. 
Africans take a trade delegation to here. Mm -hmm. And not just one-time events. I mean consistently. Oh, yeah. we, we have to have a pattern mm -hmm. of collaboration, yes. forming joint ventures, global partnerships. Yes. Uh, you know, right now, we should be exporting products that are made by black people in this region of the United States to Africa. And by, we should be bringing products from Africa here. Yes. And I think the awareness is the key thing. So the press in Africa, the press in, in, in the Caribbean, in Brazil, and in here, uh, we have to raise up uh, our, how we do our information so people will get this consciousness right. and see the opportunity. There's greater opportunities today than ever before. Gentlemen, the hour goes fast. Thank you so very much. Uh, I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. As promised, a robust conversation. My guest, the Dr. Benjamin F. Chavis, Jr. He's president and CEO of NNPA, National Newspaper Publishers Association. We call it the Black Press of America. And my co-host today, my friend and colleague here in Minnesota, Tom Gita, president and publisher of Mshale. And uh, Tom is also the chair of the Minnesota Multicultural Media Consortium. Join us next time for Conversations with Al McFarland. Thank you. That's it. Good. Good, good show. Good yeah. That's good, man. That's good. <laughs> It's just the robber So light to the merchant ships Moments after they come It took her From the bottomless pits But my hand Was made strong By the hands of the almighty And we for this generation triumphantly won't you help me shine this song's of freedom it's all I ever had redemption song Emancipate yourself from into slavery For none of them can free our mind Have no fear for atomic energy Cause no one of can stop all the time How long shall we kill our prophets While we stand aside and look at Say it's just part of it. We've got to fulfill the boon. Won't you help me sing? This song's the freedom. It's all I ever had. It Emancipate yourself from mental slavery For none of them can free our mind Have no fear for atomic energy Cause none of them can stop all the time How long shall we kill our prophets While we stand aside and look they say it's just one part of it. We've got to fulfill the boon. Won't you help me sing? Mm. This song's of freedom. Mm. It's all I ever had. Redemption song. It's all I ever had. Yeah.
tonight. We want to thank Al McFarland for bringing us all those great words and all our lovely guests, all the guests in the house. Everything's good, you know. So I want y'all to tune in every Tuesday morning right around 9 o'clock. Because we're going to play your song. All the guests will be home. We'll be feeling like talking. Have a robust conversation. Cause this thing is said, the message is clear. Everybody knows we gotta keep it right clear. We just going to talk about the Al McFarlane show.